Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all. We finally made it to the end of what I think were like 64 weeks about bread that we've been reading about from the Gospel of John. And unfortunately for us, also then to the end of our study of the letter to the Ephesians. We have finally ended and, uh, and we get to finish out with what is probably one of the most famous, famous passages out of that letter, one of the best, to put on the whole armor of God. What a wonderful image. But an image that sometimes doesn't quite work for us. If you were to kind of close your eyes and imagine someone in armor, there is a solid chance that you are imagining a medieval knight gleaming silver metallic armor, probably on horseback. You have your image brought to you from whatever movies or cartoons or museums you have been a part of. This is the armor that collectively has captured our imagination. You're probably thinking King Arthur or something like that. Large, heavy shield and sword, chainmail, plates of heavy metal, horses, visors, the whole lot. Now, that armor is indeed a distant relative of its more ancient kin, but it's that ancient kin that we really need to get back to. The Apostle Paul was writing in several different letters about armor that would have been familiar to the recipients of his letters. The passage that we read today, the most famous probably of the armor passages, was written to a people who had never seen that heavy medieval full-coverage armor, but who were as familiar with the common armor of a Roman foot soldier as you might be with the average uniform of a police officer, or perhaps their patrol cars and cruisers that you look out for just to make sure if you need to tap the brakes, you tap the brakes on time. You've seen this kind of armor from Gladiator to the movie 300 or Troy or one of the other countless movies set in Greco-Roman times or TV shows as well. This is the lighter armor of an infantryman, a foot soldier, and its design was aimed at being used in a group of other soldiers, not alone. Not that it wouldn't suffice sometimes for the lone soldier, but its design was intended to be used in a group. Now, many of us, when hearing this passage, get the sense that this passage is all about the might and power an individual person of faith can have if they'll just put on this armor that has been given to us by God. But as an alternative, consider that this is armor that requires trust, and trust that is extended beyond the individual. Consider, for instance, the shield, a shield of faith, part of this system of defense ordered and offered to a soldier, not meant merely to cover up a part of that one soldier, but intended to create some overlap, especially in formation, a testudo or a phalanx or something like that. All day long, I've been looking around for like my my sixth grade boys and stuff like that who are really usually excited about phalanxes and stuff. By this time in the sermon, I've usually lost them. <laughs> These are the, uh, the ancient world's equivalents of a modern tank. Armor linked with armor, shield with shield, sometimes shields above to keep the raining down of arrows from penetrating the formation. And with all those other pieces of armor included, breastplates and greaves and all that good stuff, multiple people grouped together would have coverage for all of the potentially exposed and vulnerable parts of an individual, but only if grouped together. Standing alongside your fellow soldier, you might know that your armor is powerful and will keep you a little bit safe, but it pales in comparison to the sense of trust you might have and how that power comes about when used in conjunction with others who have the same armor and who have been trained to use it. Some of you probably already know where I'm going with this. It's important for us to understand how these gifts that were entrusted to us are used for our mutual benefit. 
Now, this is, no doubt, in contrast to many of the ways you've probably heard a passage like this interpreted or preached through the years. On the one hand, we are typically in the American West all about uh, individualism, rugged individualism at that, and so the spiritual journey is all about your growth in Christ, sure. That's worthy of some attention, but maybe not exactly what Paul was getting at with Ephesians. And then two, another damaging interpretation of this is the idea that this is all about how Christians can get that power and then go on the offensive, to take a stance of attack toward others with whom they disagree or whom they believe to be evil, forgetting and then laying aside all these teachings of Jesus about how, you know, the wheat and the weeds are going to grow together and you just don't worry about that, I'll take care of it at the end. Or how we're supposed to address the plank in our own eye before turning and trying to address the speck in our neighbor's eye. Oh, no, 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 but in Ephesians, it seems like I'm getting licensed to sharpen my sword and to go after people. I'm looking for a fight. Some of you have probably been wounded by others who have heard and internalized that kind of interpretation. But that doesn't seem to be at all the point of what Paul is getting at here. Paul suggests that collectively we are given spiritual armor for defense against the spiritual forces of evil in this world, not flesh and blood at all. So if the target is someone else, we're already in the wrong spot. Never for attack, not even that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word, is meant for attack. That's an incredible passage worthy of deep reflection, should you find the time. A meditation on each one of the elements is good, but I don't have time today. But you might want to take some time to consider, like, why is it a breastplate of righteousness? Which it's not always, when Paul's making these references, a breastplate of righteousness, but why here? Is it a breastplate of righteousness that would guard your heart? Why is truth the belt on which you should hang your other tools and even that sword of the Spirit that is the Word? Paul is trying to say something so much deeper than what the words alone will convey, and so I would urge you to spend some time with the text sometime, especially if it's the first time you've encountered it. But it's incumbent upon me, and I must highlight this, that this armor is intended to be used in community. Whether Paul would call us uh, combatants in a spiritual battle, or whether we are just subject to the more mundane cruddiness and crappiness of the world that we live in, there's not really a good Greek word for that in the New Testament, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Right? Each of us knows what it's like to be assaulted at the level of the heart and of the spirit, and it doesn't always come from the spiritual forces of evil in this world. Sometimes it does. There is a heaviness that comes to us and can sit with us at all times, waking or sleeping, aware of it or not. We wake up sometimes and think that we've been troubled by nightmares all night. We can't quite remember them, but we wake up with a heart that's already heavy with grief and with a nervous system that's already responding with some good old fight-or-flight hormones, right? Most of us know what that feels like, and most of us know, too, what it feels like to be alone in whatever battle that is. Little can compare to the despair that comes when our sense is that we are fighting completely alone. When it seems like our life is on the line, when our soul seems to be the very battlefield that this war is waging upon. And yet, ironically, I guess ironically, I'd also say that most of us have some kind of urge when beset by these kinds of challenges and struggles to move toward isolation. You've probably seen it happen in your life or in the lives of others. Sometimes someone will say, oh, no, I'm, just, I'm a very private person. I don't want to share details. Frequently, probably more frequently than anything else in my office, what I will hear someone say is, I really just don't want to be a burden to someone else. Or maybe you are an introvert like me, 
And the impulse of the introvert is just to try to close it up inside of me. Because letting someone else be a part of my struggle seems worse sometimes. Asking for help can be hard for anyone in any of those scenarios. Receiving it can be even harder. One of the many gifts of a life of faith, though, is that we are never really alone. Now, we can mean by that that we have a good, good Savior that is with us always, who promised us to be with us even to the end of the age, no matter what we are going through. And He promised us that some of those things we would go through would be hard, but that He would be there. But it's not just that. That same Savior sent His Spirit to the church to embody His mission of love. And Ephesians from start to finish is all about how that love, that Spirit is uniting the church, weaving it together. Sometime, take the 10 minutes it'll take to read Ephesians from start to finish. It's only six chapters. It will not take you long, I promise. When you read it all at once, you really will get the sense of those golden threads that stand there and say, hey, listen, Christ has made you all one. There's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit, one church. There's one new humanity that is being made with Christ himself as the head. And so live a life that's all about being a part of that body. If you find yourself doing some things that are breaking it down, stop those things, start doing some things that will build it up. Take it seriously because that is, gift is for you and for others to be a part of, knit together into this one body. How much harder is our struggle, is your struggle, when we withdraw into isolation instead of remaining with the body that was intended for us as a gift? I wonder whether one point of this whole passage on the armor of God is to call our attention to just how dependent we really are on one another and on God's strength, especially when confronted with the evil forces of this world, when confronted with our own darkness how dependent we are on one another or need to be on one another in order to be strong, truly strong. So I encourage you, yes, to meditate on the different aspects of the armor, to consider the armor itself. But more than that, today, during these next few moments together, as you go about campus, as you go back into the world, and consider your communities to pay attention to the formation you are in. Because that armor that was entrusted to your care was not meant to be used alone. It was meant to be used in formation with others who share it, who hold their armor as good stewards and who are watchful for the well-being of the group. Consider the way that that armor has been entrusted to you and where God might be calling you to engage God's own effort to protect an individual or a community from sin and death and even the more mundane forces that harm us. My sense is that each of you is hearing these words in a slightly different way, but probably grouped more or less into one of two groups. Perhaps you are today one who woke up with that heaviness that we talked about earlier. You are facing a struggle, a soul-testing battle, and maybe you feel alone. Your own armor is getting heavy, but you don't quite understand because it also seems way too small. What might it mean for you to tuck yourself behind the shield of another? To move over a little bit toward your sibling in Christ who has strength and faith to shield you when you need it most. To recognize the strength of those around you in every place where God is sending you strong people 
to ask them, overcoming whatever is within you that doesn't want to ask, to ask them for assistance in standing firm when our knees are too feeble and weak, when we are scared, that is the time to let other people help us stand. But maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum today too. Perhaps today you woke up feeling strong. That rugged individualism is right where you were and want to stay. How about this? Be on the lookout sitting next to you, encountering you in the hallway, out in the world around us, you will find that there are others who need your strength. Wield it and the armor that was entrusted to you by our loving God to the benefit of your neighbor, some of whom have shields that are beginning to, f- to fall. Some who are just now beginning to learn how to ask for help. The promise of our world is that each of us will face hardship, will have challenge and struggle. Each of us will know the impulse toward isolation in the midst of our present darkness. But not one of us, not one of us has to walk that journey alone. Around you are others to whom God has entrusted the honor of bearing this armor, practicing their faith. and holding all of God's children in love. For that today, let us not only commit our spirits, but also let us give thanks for that good gift. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.